welcome friends to this monthly meeting we meet every month so that our minds which are scattered can get concentrated at our third eye center from where we begin our spiritual journey to collect our thoughts to collect our attention at the third eye center behind the eyes is the most essential part of effective meditation if we cannot do that it's no use sitting with eyes closed and saying we are meditating people have sat with their eyes closed in various kinds of position lotus position different kind of asanas and got nothing out of it except some little tiredness of the body if they relax in good yoga then they can get some exercise otherwise there is no purpose served meditation upon the self is a method to realize what the self is the entire spiritual journey by whatever name you call it is just to discover our own self since it is our own self it cannot be discovered except within our own self all great spiritual teachers have said the same thing many religions have been founded based upon these statements that the truth lies within you the kingdom of god is inside you that what you want to find as your true home is inside you what you are as a living force that create create a mind and sense perceptions and this physical body is all inside you all questions can be answered within yourself there is nothing outside except a reflection of what is inside we don't go inside we just sit outside and talk we talk about inside but we don't go inside meditation is not talk at all meditation is to withdraw our attention from outside to inside i have been receiving so many emails from my friends from across the world saying oh we can't meditate please help us quickly we want to see a radiant form inside asap and i said go inside asap <laughs> why not the truth is inside not outside but there are some things that have been given to us sometimes we think they are negative entities sometimes we think they are negative vices sometimes we think they are the enemies of the mind sometimes we say enemies of meditation and those five particular things that are given to us are necessary to fulfill our obligations in a special law that works in this physical creation it also works in other creations but we can noticeably see it here we notice it very much in the physical plane those five vices we call them are lust anger possessiveness greed ego we hear about them all these five are necessary for us to fulfill our karma and our obligations created by our destiny in this world that is why they are given to us something that has been given to us to deal with the world is standing in the way of our discovering our own self supposing your attention is lustful i am talking of sexual lust if you have that attention dropping to the sexual level attention is definitely going down to the sexual organs is automatic you can't be having sexual thoughts and keep the attention up so here is a very big danger and we are all experiencing it we are not attending to that we are not saying what that how to control it we are ignoring it and saying why can't we have our attention up there we get angry on the smallest provocation we get angry and anger is the fastest way to scatter your attention from the third eye center i know 
a man is sitting and saying he is doing serious meditation his wife comes and says food is ready in loving way she says come dear dinner is ready the man shouts at her don't you see i am doing meditation is he meditating can anger and concentration of attention go together we get angry and we want radiant form inside asap the two don't go together so one has to remember these things we are possessive this is mine this is my house my new car these are my new furniture i just bought i possess them and i say they are not yours if they were yours you could carry them to heaven you can't carry anything i see so many people claiming these things are theirs and they have gone and things are still here how can it be theirs and yet possessiveness is the easiest way to get attached to something unimportant can we then say we are drawing our attention in when we are actually living a life of possessiveness and attachments don't we notice that these things are coming in the way of the fundamental need to sit and concentrate your attention inside if you want to begin real meditation we have greed we want more i have seen my own friends i came to this country i had some friends who said do you know we have an american dream that was in the 60s and we need at least 40000 dollars annually to achieve our american dream at that time it was enough money when they got 200000 annually they said we want more when they got over 2 million dollars annually they were not satisfied and said this is nothing we want more what happened to the original idea of how much they need this is greed and greed has destroyed people's lives and we think we can be greedy and then have good meditation don't we see that these things are coming in the way of just pulling your attention up leave aside good meditation and of course the last the most powerful thing is the ego i am going to do it i am very good in meditation i do two and a half hours i do eight hours the i is so strong eight hours mean nothing what is the i what is i what is ego ego is nothing but the face of our thinking mind and thinking mind is not our self at all it's a machine an accessory has been given to us to use to think to communicate to write to speak it's just a computer like machine installed around our own self in the head it's not a big thing and we are identifying ourselves with that not only identifying reinforcing it by continuously saying i am saying this i want this the i does not go away it's the last thing to go and somebody said we have to be very humble humility have humility to overcome the i so i remember a man saying to me i am the humblest of the humble <laughs> do you realize how heavy that ego is is much heavier than saying i am the greatest because if he says i am the greatest you can pull his leg and say you are not but when a person say i am humblest of the humble what can we say it's a more dangerous ego and yet we are using this i so much but we can't see the radiant form of the master inside because we're not going inside how can you expect to see a result when you're not even moving towards it all these five things i've just mentioned are taking us out all the time and they, yet we do not realize that these are the very thing that are coming in the way are we handling them are we doing something to take care of them now what how do we take care of these when they are necessary 
for us to fulfill our obligations, duties, and karma created by our own destinies. How do we take care of them? It's a thin-edged sword. It cuts both ways. We need them and we don't want them. It's a question like that. How do we take care of it? There are means available to those who are following the spiritual path seriously. That's, let's start with anger. If you can separate yourself from the mind even for five minutes, you will not be angry. Try it out. Mind gets angry, not you. Now I am saying when you, I am saying you, the self. The self is life. Self is soul. Self is that makes the mind alive. Self is that makes the sense perception alive. Sense is that makes the body alive. Sense is that makes the whole world alive around us. That is why if we are even contemplating, not realizing, even contemplating, we are the self, the soul, and not the mind, you will observe the mind, and mind will look at you in no anger. There's a way out. If you have lustful thoughts, you call them love. True love replaces that. And that is why when these perfect living masters come to us, they allow themselves to become an experience of love. Not because that is the only thing for which they come, but they become a, a beloved of ours. How? Because they perform small, small private miracles in our lives and we feel their presence in everything we do every day and we feel that this is Master's hand in this. Small, small things which make us feel attracted outside, they begin to attract us inside. If we do meditation by trying to put our attention inside, you have to try to start with because we still think the mind has to do it. Meditation is a technique designed for the mind. So when the mind tries to pull inside and you remember the experiences with these unique people whom we call perfect living masters, they are unique because they are very ordinary, but their love is extraordinary. That's a very unique feature, that they should be completely ordinary people and their love should be so extraordinary that it is completely unconditional completely, totally unconditional. They will love you. These people we call perfect living masters have come so we can have a ex real experience of true love. They love you if you love them. They love you if you don't love them. They love you if you hate them. They love you if you kill them. That's the kind of love that comes from these perfect living masters. When that kind of love appeals to us, to our real self, not to our mind, not to our senses, not to our body. Their love is true love and appeals where true love comes from within ourselves. True love does not come from our thinking. True love does not come from our sense perceptions. True love does not come from the body. True love comes from our soul. Love is one of those things that comes spontaneously and not in time. All mental activity is in time and love is not. It's spontaneous, sudden. So that is why true love that we all have is experienced with somebody whose love is unconditional because we are so much used to calling attachments as love. We are attached to somebody and we call it love. What is the difference really between attachment and love? It's a very simple difference. In attachments, you say, I love you, I love this, I love that thing. I comes before you. I come before anything else. That is attachment. The ego is very strong in attachment. When true love comes, we forget the I and only think of the beloved. The beloved takes the place of where the I was. The big difference when one falls truly in love with anybody, at that moment, I is not in the front. The beloved 
who has pulled you is in front. That is why it is well said by a Persian mystic, Iranian mystic, Ishq awal dar dile ma shukh paida mishwad. Love is first born in the heart of the beloved. That means if there is no pull, you can't experience true love. True love is not born by you. I think I want to love somebody and I love. That's called mental attachment. Therefore, this is a distinction between true love and what happens when we meet a perfectly we master. Something happens to us at a non-mental level, at a spiritual level, at the level of the soul. It's an experience of love more than anything else. That love draws us. The mind can revolt against this, this feeling, but the love continues. People think so hard about the encounters with perfect living masters, and they try to figure out what's going on. And they say there's nothing that can make us believe something unless we see external empirical proof. And yet the love keeps on growing. I mentioned the other day. A true story, which I watched with my own eyes. A professor, intellectual professor, used to come to great master, and he used to tell great master, master, what you say is not right; it's wrong. You are making a fool of people. You have made up a big story. Oh, there are higher levels of consciousness, higher worlds living there. Nobody seen them. There's a true home somewhere inside, hidden us. How can you talk like this? He told Great Master. There is no proof, no evidence of any of the things you are saying. He says, "I have thought with my mind. These things don't exist. We just create them. These are stories created by people, and you are making a fool of people by making them believe all this." Great Master said, "Professor, you have a right to your opinion. Your own experience." Is telling you what you are telling me. My experience is a little different. We have a right to disagree. We have a right to have our own experiences. So thank you very much for your honesty in telling me how you feel. But my experience is different. Thank you very much. The professor went away. Next week, next weekend, he was back, and he told Great Master, "I've come back to tell you, please don't make a fool of people. Understand, there is no evidence for what you are saying." Great Master said, "Yes, I understand that that's your point of view. It's your experience. Your it's based upon your thinking. You have a right to have that thinking, but I have a different experience, and therefore I cannot deny my own experience. But thank you very much for expressing your opinion." Third week, and he was again back. Great Master said, "Now, Professor, what this time? He said, 'I've come to tell you.'" This, there is no evidence for what you are saying. It's not true. A great master said, "Professor, you told me the same thing two weeks twice earlier. So do you think it's necessary to come again to repeat it?" He said, "I don't know, but I feel like coming to see you." <laughs> And after initiation, he was one of the finest disciples. So you can see the conflict between the soul and the mind. The soul is pulled by love. The mind wants proof, a proof outside. There is plenty of proof inside. We don't go inside. We just talk outside. Go inside. Enough proof exists. If you have a slightest experience of inside, not all the experience, slightest experience, which very often perfect way masters give us. Once, sometimes twice, right in the beginning of the initiation, and then we don't get it again. It's just to tell us there is something there. Here is internal uh, internal experience. Then they give external experience after that, so you can feel the presence of the master. You can feel things are not happening according to law of probability. Some exceptions are being made here for you. You always say this can't be master. Has to be master. The little glimpse of an internal experience, followed by these other experiences, continues to build our love, the spiritual love, and continues to take us to where the master is pulling us with his love. 
So there is this conflict that the mind comes, but when you are experiencing the true love, the outside attachments disappear. The more you experience the true love, you begin to say, don't care for anything else. It's automatic. People think that it's very easy to detach ourselves from an attachment. It's not easy at all. I generally don't like to use the word impossible, but I sometimes feel to say that by practicing detachment, you can detach is impossible. My experience and experience of all the people I've checked with is the more they try to detach, the more attached they got with it. I give my own example. I came to the United States so many years ago, and there used to be a nice pizza called G. Old Shaky's Pizza. I like the name and also the pizza. I got attached to it. And I said, this is terrible. I am getting attached to a simple item of food. What kind of spiritual practice will I do? So I said, no more Shaky's Pizza. The more I said, the pizza stood in front of me. It almost always happens. There was a young man telling people in India recently, sent me a tape of his talk that he gave. In that, he's telling people, never tell your children, don't do this. If you say, tell them, don't do this, they will always do it. Even if they were not going to do it, by telling them, don't tell a lie, they will tell lies. If you just tell them, always tell the truth, they will not tell lies. Always say in a positive way, not negative. Because when you say don't, you do that, what you're telling, don't. And he gave an example to the audience. He, all right, I'll give you a little example. Everybody close your eyes. And they all close their eyes. About 1,000 people were listening to him. And he said, don't think of your mother. <laughs> Don't think you have a picture of her in front of you. Everybody remember the mother I saw a picture. He said, I am saying, don't do it. Why are you doing it? The mind works like that. You cannot practice detachment. The only way to be detached is after some time, I found nice pizza from a place called Pizza Hut. <laughs> I forgot Shaky's Pizza. That is how the attachments, which are numerous attachments we all have, all the time, we are building new attachments all the time. They go away with a single powerful unconditional love that we experience from a perspective master. A very important role a human being performs in our life. People ask me, if God is inside us and has to be found inside us, do we need an agent outside to help us? If everything is inside, why should we go to somebody called a master or something? We should just find out inside. How can somebody outside help us if the truth is inside? It's very difficult to explain the secret, but I'll tell you. I'll try to explain to you. Whatever is outside is coming from inside, including the master. Whatever you are seeing here outside, is a reflection, a projection from inside. Our attention is outside, so we only say there's a reality outside. Go inside, find the original copy of what you're seeing outside. You can see the original of this universe inside. You'll see the original of the master inside. Not only just see, if you raise your consciousness, to higher level, you will discover the master is your own self. Your true self is being represented externally by deflection, in the form of another human being outside as a master. He's not a master is not guiding you to something outside. He's guiding you to pull inside. You are pulling yourself, but you can't go and can't see. Therefore, he appears outside. If you could see a master inside, no master outside is necessary. It's just a reflection of your own true self. And this is a difficult concept for us to understand when we take the outside creative experience as the only reality. 
देयर फोर वी हैव टू लुक फॉर इट आउटसाइड देयर फोर मैस्टर्स अपियर आउटसाइड इफ यू गो इन साइड इवन वन स्टेप देर अपियर इन साइड यू गो टू स्टिल हायर लेवल ऑफ अवेयरनेस दे विल बी देयर मोर रियल देन यू हैव सीन आउटसाइड सो अंडरस्टैंड द नेचर ऑफ दिस क्रिएशन हाउ इट्स ए प्रोजेक्शन फ्रॉम द टोटैलिटी लाइंग इन साइड अस and that is why when we beat perfectly with masters the love that pulls us is our own love pulling us but we see it as if it's coming from outside because our concept of reality is all outside based it's remarkable how this reality has been created this physical reality that we see outside is created by a very simple process you have a mind to think you have sense perceptions and create everything in the sense perceptions you see it outside i give you example i'm seeing these beautiful flowers okay i'm also touching them oh i feel very good <laughs> they are real you know i just described reality because i experienced it how did i experience reality of these flowers i can see them and touch them i can also smell them i let's say if take a leaf i can taste them i can do all these things all of them are sense perceptions no other proof at all all these were sense perceptions being used at the physical level creating reality for me okay let me see can one see flowers like that if they were not there we can see right now with our imagination i can close my eyes and see them i open my eyes i can see them right here i can see the same flowers this side seeing is not reality imaginary seeing is also the same thing seeing is seeing if seeing were only possible with the eyes i would say yes it's a definite reality if i can see otherwise also then seeing is just a sense perception so is touch so is smell if all sense perceptions are operating the same way people sometimes try to understand how do we see things the scientists have a very simple explanation doctors have a very simple explanation people who see the anatomy of the eye have simple explanation that objects exist presumption objects exist and light falls upon them light has many colors if you want to see them separate the light through a, a lens a prism or something or look at the sky in a rainbow the same white light becomes so many colors actually we say there seven colors or so many but there are millions of colors at different ranges i bought a tv set it was very modern i tried to understand its modernity and the modernity was it operates on three pixels and of three colors that generate how many colors three colors generate 16 million colors on a tv therefore this so wonderful bright looks absolutely natural all shades are covered by it three colors creating that so ha it's the same thing like when say light falls upon an object and whatever colors are in that object are absorbed what is not absorbed is reflected and that's what we see if i am wearing a blue shirt i am not really wearing blue my shirt is absorbing every color except blue therefore you see blue i am telling you a scientific ex explanation of vision okay then this particular color and shape travels in near parallel light uh, uh, rays parallel rays to my eyes and touches my eye and then its cornea and the and the aqueous humor the vitreous humor the liquids that are filled in they act like a lens and there's a lens placed in the middle so that a nice upside down picture of what i'm seeing is created on the retina
very interesting. So retina carries a picture. And that picture is then carried, they separated. What is the color and what's the shape? Rods and cones, two separate functions of the retinal optic nerve ending at the retina, carry them to the optic area in the brain. And the brain interprets. And the thinking mind puts those colors and shapes together and says it's a flower. Eyes can never see a flower. Eyes can see shape and color. How do you make it a flower? The mind makes it by thought. That's the process. And that only happens if you are awake and conscious. If you're unconscious, the eyes are open, you don't see it. So consciousness picks up from there. Now I want to suggest, just for an examination, supposing our retinas are gifted with making pictures of their own, and they make a picture of a flower, the rest of the process is identical and we see the pictures exactly as outside. And we will see at a distance, how can we create distance? Two eyes create, carrying two different images. Then they merge. They merge not in the retina. They merge not in the optic nerve. They merge in the brain. When they merge in the brain, how do we feel we are looking at the flowers? I am seeing single bunch of flowers. My eyes are seeing two bunches right now. Because no two eyes can see the same thing. They are separated. That's how they create the 3D movies and all that by creating two pictures on the screen and giving us special glasses to wear and they immerse them and they look like three-dimensional. Exactly we are doing with the two eyes. The merger is taking place in the head of the brain. If the retina was equipped with the power to make images, we'd see the world exactly as it is, with the same distances as now. Supposing retina has nothing to do with it, it's the optic nerve that does it. We still see the same way. Supposing it's not the optic nerve but the brain that does it, we still see the same way. People see hallucinations. Why do we call it hallucination? They see it, we don't. But they are seeing it. How are they seeing it? Same process. The process starts from inside out. And therefore, they hallucinate. Are we not all hallucinating? Maybe because we are most of us hallucinating, that's an exception to the rule. We call him hallucinator. We are looking at the reality. Supposing the ultimate pickup of what we are seeing is with consciousness. If we are not conscious, we don't pick up that, even from the brain. Supposing consciousness has a flower in its head, do you know it will create the same flower in the optic nerve, in the optic center, in the optic nerve, in the retina and outside? There is no proof at all which way the reality is being created, from inside out or from outside in. Which is the cause, which is the effect? People have sometimes given a simple definition. Cause comes first, effect comes later. We all accept it. You can't have something and then say the cause has come afterwards. Of course, this theory has been blown away by a particle in a, in a lab here. A particle has been forced to travel at a velocity greater than the velocity of light. Einstein thought it will never be done. It has been done now. When it was sent, the particle reached the destination before it left. The pictures are there. It's amazing things. The quantum mechanics is going to come and destroy all old thoughts. More and more is coming to prove spiritual truths. You'll be surprised. They're going to prove spiritual truths. The power of the observer that can make a wave into a particle, discovered long ago, is coming into play now when you'll see quantum computers come up. Your thoughts will create what the digital language should be. Zeros can be made one, ones can be made zeros, changing the whole digital language. Look at the power of what is happening in consciousness. Now, if you can understand all the sense perceptions work identically, that they are all led into the brain, into the, uh, into the different areas of sense perception, and that's how we are experiencing this world. 
if you say cause comes first, okay, let's examine that. D do these flowers exist and I see them? Do they come before I see them? Or do they come after I see them? This has been examined so closely, this question. They come simultaneously with no gap of time at all. Not even a billionth part of a, of a nanosecond. They are identical. They, seeing and what we are seeing are identical similar time. Now if the scientists are fighting in their head to prove something outside, the answer is very simple inside. They don't go inside. They don't want to connect something which they believe is not real. This is imaginary. Outside is real. And I am saying the reality has been created only by the use of a separated sense of perceptions. A single perception would not have done that. But the division of perception has done and made everything real outside. Because only way to check reality outside is using one perception against another. Okay, in the old days they said, Question was put more simply. I made beautiful flowers by example. There is the example of a tree. Is the tree there because you see it? Or the, you see it because it is there? Yes, of course you see it because it is there. You take the tree away, you don't see it. Very simple answer. But don't you realize that the tree and the taking away of the tree is the same thing, same experience? happening identically at the same time as your experience of seeing the tree, the placing of the tree and taking away the tree is also happening at the same time. There's no difference. Again, we are using the same combination of sense perceptions to create our reality. And yet the answers to these questions are so clearly available to us inside where you can see the original of what is being projected outside and why it is, how it is made. We are all living a life over which we have very little control. We did not know where to be born. We didn't decide that. Not the ones that are living here. We didn't decide. We just born. We didn't pick up our parents. We did not choose the place of birth. We did not choose the place where we'll grow up. We did not choose where we'll go to school. We did not choose who we will meet. We did not choose who we will marry. We did not choose where we will die. We did not choose how many kids we will have. They all happened as if the whole thing was programmed and pre-written because we had no control. We never did anything. But between these events, between birth and death, a lot of things happened. And in between them, we found some spaces to make decisions. There the mind worked. If you look at your own life, you'll see more than 80% of the events of life are fixed, no choice. But 20% are the gaps where you make choices. Not because you want to make choices, but you're forced to make choices. Because alternatives and options appear before you. You have to choose this or that. I can decide whether to go this side or that side. I can decide whether to sit in the chair or not to sit in the chair. I can decide what time to come, what time not to come. There are options available to us and we make decisions there. That's a very small period of total life if you look at it. But those are the periods when our mind works, works hard and has to decide what is better for us. And we develop inside a code to determine which is the better choice. Codes are determined not by uh, some internal thinking. We are not born with those codes. The codes develop from what the parents tell us, what the school teachers tell us, most importantly what our religion tells us. This is good, this is bad. Do this, don't do this. Yet these are instilled into our brains very strongly. All the impressions are put in and we have a moral code in our head. 
when we examine our moral codes, we find 100 years ago, that was not the moral code. In other countries today, there's not the moral code. In other cultures, there's not the moral code. So obviously, the moral code of good and bad is designed by us, by our own destiny. With all the other events, 80% events have developed and we've gone through that and have a moral code of what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong. So we say, this is right, I will do it. Well, we have a guidance now. A guidance how to make decisions in your life. Do what is right. But when the authors of the moral code say, don't do it, we do it. That leads to a very strange experience. It's called guilt. See how guilty we feel? People are being killed by their guilt. They are feeling so bad because they are feeling guilty. Why are they feeling guilty? They did not follow the moral code because the moral code contained the word don't. Imagine what we are going through. And it almost looks like we are very helpless people. That we have grown up somewhere over which we have no control. That has developed our moral code. We are following, not following the moral code, feeling guilty, committing sins. And we regret. If I had a second chance, we won't do it. But we still do it. We have so many second chances. Oh, next time I won't. We still do it. I remember telling a little story which, which I exchanged with my daughter. We couldn't stop laughing. Then I tried to hold my mouth while telling the story. Once upon a time, two hunters, they were elk hunters, they hired a small plane to go up in the mountains where elks are living and they hunted and killed four elks and they dragged them to the small plane and the pilot of the plane said, sorry sir, this is uh, too big a load, this plane cannot carry, make two sorties, make two trips and carry two. They said, no, last year we carried all four in one plane. So how can you say you can't carry? So they forced the pilot to load all the four <coughs> elks onto the plane. The plane crashed. As the pilot said, pilot died. Somehow these two survived. And they got out of the debris and one asked the other, where are we? He said, same place like last year. <laughs> Just an example how we keep on repeating the same thing. Knowing is wrong. So that is why when we make the decisions, we think, okay, I feel sorry. You don't know you're sowing the seeds of another visit to the same experience again. That is how reincarnation is created by our own experience of guilt and remorse. And if I had another chance, I won't do it. All right, get another chance. But we have to see how memory works. Memory is a very tricky thing. It's a beautiful thing, tricky thing. I could one day explain to you how all our experience we are having here is nothing but recall of memory. That's a bigger subject. One day I'll do it. But the memory is a tricky thing that we can't hold on to it. We can't remember what we ate a month ago. I can't remember what breakfast I had yesterday. And at age 91, that happens. Age reduces your memory. And what happened when you were infants, you don't remember. You grow up, you forget very quickly. Memory is very short. And certainly we completely forget what happened in a previous life of ours. Therefore, we, it is disconnected. It's disconnected. We can't even imagine that what we are going through now is because we asked for a second chance to not do what we are feeling guilty about last time. We got a second chance. We forgot what it is all. We do the same thing again and again and again and get trapped forever. That is the whole principle of reincarnation, that it is something left over that brings us back. If nothing was left over, we wouldn't have to come back. 
After all, when we are in a physical body, it creates a physical life, physical universe for us. When we die, what happens? Nobody knows. We all speculate. Do, does the show end there? If the show ends there, and the whole show of life is merely from the point of birth to the point of death, and there is a creator who created this show, he was the most discriminatory and most unfair creator. If this life was the only life he has created so much disparity between all human beings, made some very rich and happy, made some people poor and starving, we can't pray to that God like that. Obviously that could not be the truth. Even if there is no God but only our own self-creating, it cannot be fair at all. But that is not true. Not only did we have a life before we came here, we will have a life after we die. Any proof? Yes. Not outside. Go inside. What is the meaning of going inside when you are in a physical body? It means having the same experience you will have when you die. Same experience you had before you were born. Any proof of that? Yes, the only proof I have that I was living yesterday is my memory. The only proof I have that I had the same body yesterday is my memory. And when you go inside, you will have a memory of what happened 150 years ago. This body wasn't there. Your memory, not somebody else's. Proof? You want a more proof? Go still higher. Within yourself. In a form that neither the physical nor sensory perceptions, only your life, soul and mind. Go to that form. It's possible. You will know not only one life, you will know all your lives. Millions of them designed to go through memory. Do you have to go through them? No. You created them. You go still higher, you know how they are created. All correct answers, well verified, convincing answers to all these questions lie within us, not outside. And we are searching for them outside all the time. How can we find them outside when we are taking outside as the only reality? One good thing that happens when we go inside is we discover that this is not the only reality. Actually, we should discover even now. When we go to sleep, we have dreams. Dreams look very real, but only while dreaming. They can't look real when you are awake. But when you're dreaming, you don't know where your body is sleeping. You don't know where you are, except the self in the dream is the same self that was awake, not a different self. Self is still the same, dream is real. And dream can be very interesting or terrifying. You are afraid. Supposing you see a sad dream, you wake up, you'll have tears in your eyes even when you are awake. You took the dream so seriously. If you have a happy dream, you wish you could dream a little longer. I once had a dream. I won a lottery. Five million dollars in the dream. They asked me, you want a check or cash? I said, I want to see five million cash. I've never seen that much money. So they brought a tray full of currency notes. And I was seeing, when they were just going to give me, I woke up. I tried very hard to go back to sleep. At least collect it once. The reality pierces us in a dream while the dream is on. When we wake up, the wakeful reality so quickly destroys the early reality that we forget our dreams within a few seconds. The average time for which we forget the dream is 30 seconds by dream experts, sleep experts. I have worked with them, by the way, and I know what happens. We all dream every day many times, and many people say, I never dream. No, you never remember. 
the dream. They get erased so fast. So, but the dream state looks real when you wake up, destroyed. You go to higher state, this way becomes like a dream. Every state looks like it's a dream created from a higher level of wakefulness. Therefore, spiritual progress can also be called higher wakefulness, one level to another. But these are all possible. Can a person who is sleeping and having a dream wake up on his own? Not really. I have heard, especially younger children, telling us, telling me they had a dream and they found out that they are dreaming and they want to know where are they dreaming. They are running around looking for the bed on which they are sleeping. It's part of the dream. When they wake up, they had never left the bed. But they are searching for it. But they couldn't wake up. Many adults have also shared their dreams with me that we couldn't find ourselves when we felt it was a dream. Can you wake up when you like, whenever you like in a dream? Not really. There's one easy way. Easy way is if you are lying down sleeping and dreaming and your friend is awake sitting next to you and he gives you a little nod, get up, get up, you will wake up. Because he's awake. But supposing you have a, having an interesting dream. For example, you are feeling, you have some horses, you have to take them back to the stable. You hold in the two horses and pulling them in the dream and he is nudging you, wake up, say, wait, I have to take the horses. And the man who is awake says, don't worry, I'll hold your horses and you wake up. Do you call that man a liar who said, I will hold your horses? No. Why not? Because the horses were only in the dream. And he said, I will hold your horses when he was participating in your dream. Do you know that is the role of perfect living masters? They are awake at the level higher than us. And when we feel that pull of love and become seekers, it's a nudge being given to us. The whole process of finding a master or going and being found by a master, the whole process is a nudge given by somebody awake who's picked you up that your right turn has come to wake up. Then we can wake up any time. Don't have to live the whole life in ignorance and then say suddenly when we die, oh, I wish I had known this earlier. You can know it earlier. You can be woken up earlier. You can see the afterlife while you are living here. You can die while living. Which reminds me of his little story. Old story I've told many times. Some of you may not have heard it. But I like to repeat it for myself. It helps me. Once upon a time, that's how all stories begin, there was a merchant in India who did business of imports and exports with Africa. He would carry Indian silks and other garments and things like that to Africa and brought cashews and other nuts from Africa. That was normal business he was doing. Every year he made one trip. On one of the trips in Africa, he passed through a forest. A forest and saw a lot of parrots there. Little birds, beautiful birds. And he said, when I finish my work, I wish I could take one of the parrots as a pet for me. So on his way back, he picked up one of the parrots, got a cage and brought the parrot back home. And he taught the parrot how to speak, how to do things, gave him nice parrot food. I don't know what they called here. In India, we call it chilies and churi. Churi is made from flour with some nice molasses or sugar or something. And parrots love it. And sharp chilies, green, red, they love it also. So he fed them with good food and he learned, they learned, uh, the parrot learned how to sing and dance and talk. Next year when he was going back to Africa, he told the parrot in the cage, I am going to your home country. Do you have any message for the people back at home? He said, tell them, I am enjoying my life in this beautiful cage. 
I eat churi and chilies and I laugh and dance. I'm very happy. So, after finishing his work in Africa that season, he called all the parrots in the jungle, said, Come here, folks, I've got a message for you. You remember I took one parrot with me to India. He sent you a message. The message is, he's enjoying his cage in which he lives and he enjoys eating churi and he's laughing, dancing, very happy. On hearing this, one elder, elderly parrot sitting on the branch near him had tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. He felt very sorry. This parrot must have been very close to the one I took that he could not bear to hear the message. So he returned home and told the parrot in a cage, I conveyed your message that you are enjoying your churi and you are enjoying your food, you are enjoying dancing, speaking, laughing. But when I told the story, one elderly parrot had tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. On hearing this, the parrot in the cage had tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. He said, oh foolish trader, you should have known if they were so close to each other. You should not have told this story. Anyway, parrot was dead. He opened the cage and threw the body out. As soon as he threw the dead parrot out, the parrot opened its wings and flew up. He said, so you aren't dead after all? And the parrot said, nor is the other guy dead. He just sent me a message. And the message was, if you want to get out of this cage, die while living. Thank you very much. I'll see you later, 3 o'clock again.